In a market dominated by Toys R Us, one company stood out as the second largest toy retailer in the United States. Today, we're talking about Child World. It begins in Massachusetts in 1962, when Sidney Schneider, a Boston native, would team up with his former co-worker Joseph Arnasano to found Child World Incorporated in Quincy, with the company headquartered in Avon. The Child World stores were well known for their warehouse-style layout, and much like their competitor, employed a big box model, with long aisles and overstock stored in plain view. The stores used the grid layout, used everywhere from Walgreens to Walmart. This layout maximizes product exposure but makes quicker shopping difficult. However, it loses traffic flow for a more forced customer path, making the end caps of the aisles a great opportunity for product exposure and impulse buying. Chains like Target use this layout, but usually opt for the equally popular racetrack layout. Children's Palace, yet another toy chain to cash in on the relatively new superstore craze, would be founded in 1968. The Lionel Corporation also had a bid in the toy business, with their Kitty City chain founded the next year. Child World would acquire Children's Palace in 1975 from Kobacker Stores for $3.5 million. By 1981, Child World was ranked as the second largest toy seller in the United States, right behind Toys R Us. As well as toys, the chains also sold pets. The Cole National Corporation, founded by Joseph Cole, operated Things Remembered, as well as several optical centers like Cole Vision, as well as Sears Optical and Montgomery Ward Vision. Cole would acquire Child World Incorporated that same year in what would be called its highest profile deal, and would oversee the latter of the company's most dominant era. Peter Hayes would step up as president, and in 1985, they would sell off 18% of Child World to the public, by which point the company operated over 100 stores in 21 states under the Child World and Children's Palace banners. Throughout the 1980s, Child World's main focus remained on growing its brand power, and their stores were beginning to get run down. The must-have toy lines of the 80s, like Teddy Ruxpin and Cabbage Patch Kids, would see the chains get unprecedented traffic as parents scrambled to secure one for their kids. Peter Panda, the chain's mascot, was beginning to be a serious challenger to Jeffrey. The stores had an iconic, castle-inspired design and an even more playful atmosphere than Toys R Us, but the latter would become the ultimate winner when it came to recognition. At a time when Toys R Us was focused on expansion and innovation, the antiquated design of Child World would end up seeing their clients go to their competitor. They didn't miss a chance to turn it around, though, and would announce a new in-store format, which would prioritize swapping out their warehouse design for a more hands-on atmosphere. This would be very well received and saw good results in the Christmas season, leading the company to announce the implementation of this design into 11 other stores. However, the chain wouldn't get to see the company-wide remodel they were planning. By this time, the company operated around 182 units nationwide. Entering the 90s, Hayes would resign from the company and many of his fellow executives would follow suit, beginning a trend of frequent management changes with each executive taking the company in a different direction. That year would also mark the beginning of the 1990 recession, which would continue through to the following March. The economy continues to grind down, taking stocks, bonds, and the dollar with it. We'll assess what our future will be like under the cheap dollar and what it means to our standard of living. With less money to spend on luxuries, Americans would turn to anyone who could offer a price cut. Child world simply couldn't. Brand power aside, money talks. And there weren't any coveted toy lines that would pull traffic back to the stores like before. Cole would restrict the amount of money going into the company and would result in them missing payment deadlines and racking up debt. This led to companies like Lego ignoring any requests for shipments and would see their overstock become understocked as they struggled to fill shelves. But Cole wouldn't let go until it was already too late. The chains would hold massive sales and started closing underperforming locations. 
but Cole was able to sell off Child World to a limited partnership in Avon, in agreement that Cole would take the grunt of the debt. The partnership would give control of the company to a group of former Toys R Us executives, but it wouldn't see any change, and would end up closing around 26 locations and would lose their line of credit amid heavy quarterly losses. The company would enter 1991 with a debt in the neighborhood of $300 million, and it would prove to be their cause of death. With rising buy-ups in industry consolidation, along with intense pressures from Toys R Us and no help coming from newly impoverished Americans, they would be crushed under their debt. But this was a trend across the board, as Kitty City would enter Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection that year. As many American companies would slim down their operations, it would seem that the toy market would as well, and simply wasn't big enough for three dominant chains to survive. The industry would see several others hit the dust, from Circus World to K&K, &K, both acquired by KB. Child World would end up closing over half their fleet, bringing the store count to 71, mostly focused in the Northeast. However, this was like using a band-aid to stop a sinking ship, and Child World would also file for Chapter 11. The presiding judge would find viable evidence that the Avon partnership had intentionally sabotaged the company, with the plan of liquidating it to avoid paying the debt they owed. Kitty City, still in bankruptcy at this time, had announced work on plans of a merger with Child World, but it wouldn't come to fruition as the company couldn't secure the capital necessary and would announce the closure of the entirety of their stores the following June. Child World's massive markdowns would ultimately become liquidation sales, and the process would take about six weeks to complete before the company was no more. Their late decision to adapt a new in-store format was coupled with the debt due to coal and the recession's effect on the market, making a pretty deep hole that they simply weren't equipped to get out of. Even if they somehow managed to merge with Kitty City or survive in some other way, Walmart would have destroyed them. If we take a look at another industry, like with video rental, Hollywood Video was second behind Blockbuster for decades, but saw a similar fate for all the same reasons. Consolidation has become a bigger trend in modern business. Whether big box chains or department stores and even websites, there's always someone who can do it better, and more importantly, at a cheaper price. Even Toys R Us, a category killer when it came to the toy industry, was eventually overtaken by Walmart and Amazon. The world is slowly realizing that we don't need multiple stores that essentially do the same thing, online or physical, and Child World is a prime example of what happens when you become second best.